Also, to those of you watching on YouTube, thanks for joining us. I see there's some folks joining us on that platform as well. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we will we will get started here. Uh, good evening, or good evening from, from Belmont, Massachusetts. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. Uh, we're glad you could be with us today for mapping the Armenian highland with Matthew Karanian. This program today is the second of three Nasser is holding in 2022, focusing on maps and cartography, a series that is supported by the Dadorian Foundation, whom we thank for their generosity to us for a third consecutive year. The first program with Ruben Galician took place in March and can be viewed on our YouTube channel. The third and final map-related program, uh, Khachig Muradian's Gas Balloons, Emperors, and Armenian Map Makers, a cartographic journey through the Library of Congress's collections, will take place at this time one week from now. I would like to mention, too, that my colleague Ani Babayan at Nasser and I are finishing up a Treasures of the, of the Nasser Mardigian Library feature, highlighting some of the map and atlas holdings in our own collection, which will be disseminated and posted on our website soon. Before we begin tonight's talk, I'd also like to bring your attention to some of the upcoming programs we have planned before the year runs out. And to add a reminder to all of you that the work we do both in the realm of public programming and in all aspects of Nasser's work to advance Armenian studies and scholarship only happens through the support of our members and friends. So if you appreciate the value of the work that we do and the programs that we offer, please do what you can by becoming a Nasser member or donate at whatever level, level you are able to. And if you are already a Nasser member and donor, thank you so very much. We are continuing to do both online only uh, and in-person programs, which whenever possible will also be live streamed. Uh, we do encourage those of you who are able to attend events in person, whether at our uh, headquarters in Belmont or in other parts of the country, to do so. It's still nice to see people in person. But we thank you for your interest and attendance in any form, even if you are watching this after the fact on YouTube. So next Tuesday, December 13th at 7.30 p.m., I would invite you to join us as we present a webinar by Umit Kurt entitled Talat Pasha's Genocide Technocrat, a biography of Mustafa Reshat Mimarolu. Uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by Nasser, the Ararat Askijian Museum, and the Society for Armenian Studies. And you can watch this on Zoom and on YouTube. I mentioned previously Khachig Muradian's talk uh, on, on maps that will take place next week. Khachig will be the featured speaker during the Nasser Holiday Open House, which will be next Thursday, December 15th, at the Nasser Vartan Gregorian Building in Belmont, Mass. He will be uh, featured in a special youth program at 5 p.m., engaging in conversation with Harvard doctoral student Julia Hintlion and the audience on the books and authors that inspired my journey. This will be an in-person only event. And at 7.30 p.m., we will present the aforementioned lecture, Gas Balloons, Emperors, and Armenian Map Makers, A Cartographic Journey Through the Library of Congress's Collections. Again, the five o'clock program will be in-person only. The 7.30 lecture on maps will be in-person and streamed live. Also on December 15th, as part of the open house, there will be a one day only 20% discount for in-store and online sales of all items in the Nasser bookstore. This is all information that you can find on our website, nasser.org. So with that, it's a pleasure for me again to have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Matthew Karanian. Matthew practices law in Pasadena, California, and he is a former law professor and associate dean of the law school at the, Armenian, at the American University of Armenia. He is the author or co-author of several books about Armenia, including Armenia and Karabakh, The Stone Garden Travel Guide, Historic Armenia After 100 Years, Ani, Kars, and the Six Provinces of Western Armenia, uh, and The Armenian Highland, Western Armenia, and the First Armenian Republic of 1918. 
Matthew is also a superb photographer, as anyone familiar with these books is well aware. He was the 2016 recipient of Armenia's Arshil Gorky Medal, given in recognition of his service to the homeland and for his role in helping to unite the homeland and the worldwide diaspora of Armenians. We will now hear how a series of maps that his great uncle Marduros Karanyan produced uh, one century ago encouraged Matthew's own research on Armenia and guided him along the way. Uh, I invite you to, to submit questions uh, that I will present to Matthew using the uh, Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we can now share your screen, Matthew. And welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> My journey mapping the Armenian highland began like so many journeys often begin. It began without my knowledge, my, without my conscious awareness. I was maybe 12 years old and I was in the family room of our family home in New Britain, Connecticut. And I had some friends over and on one wall of this family room, there was a large map of ancient Armenia. And when I say large, I mean, it, it took up the entire wall. It was, if you consider sofa art, it was as big as a sofa. And I can remember one or more of my friends saying, oh, what is that thing on the wall? And my 12-year-old me gave the answer that only a 12-year-old could give for its ignorance. I said, oh, that's a map of this place that used to be called Armenia. And my friend said, oh, that's interesting. And we went on our way. That's all that map was to me. It was an artifact of something that used to be something that no longer was. But it occupied such a large part of, first of all, this room that I spent a lot of time in, our family room, and also a large part of my family life. It's something that I saw every day. And even though I didn't understand as a 12 year old, the significance of what I was looking at on the wall, I was able to see every day, the typography, the calligraphy, the artwork, the artistry of the map. And that artwork became engraved in my mind. And I began to appreciate the work that had been done by this person, Mardik Kheranyan, who I learned was my grandfather's father's brother. That makes him my great uncle. He was preserving our Armenian culture through maps. And it took me a while to understand how important his role in preserving Armenian culture was. But it's a component of, of the, what I see as four pillars of preserving our culture. We obviously know about narrative histories and how important our written histories are. And we know how important archaeologists are to our preservation of our history and the preservation of actual artifacts, Armenian artifacts, whether they be manuscripts or the physical churches or hotchkars. I have had a personal interest in photography myself since I was perhaps eight years old. And so I understood that as an important component of preservation of our history. And what Mardik Kheranyan did uh, was also an integral part of preserving our history. You know, I, I, like so many of us, we look at maps and we think, well, a map is something that we use to place ourselves in the world. We want to see where, where we are in relationship in context with every other place that we know about. And, and that's one function of a map. Uh, another function of maps that we use probably every day is getting from one place to another. It's for navigation, to try to get from place A to place B. And I used maps of ancient Armenia to, do, to, to accomplish just that. And here what you see on the screen is a, a hand-drawn map of the village of Havav in the region of Palu in Western Armenia, hand-drawn on a piece of scrap paper by a genocide survivor who wrote down everything he could remember, everything he could remember about what street names 
there were in his town, where the churches were, and you can see the churches on this hand-drawn map, the names of the streets, and this map, sketched out by hand by someone who was not a professional, is in many ways just as important as some of those maps that Mardik Kheranyan created, because it places us and gives us our bearings. And I used this map uh, in Havav to try to locate with success uh, the ancestral homes of some Armenians. So that's one of the functions of maps uh, in mapping the Armenian highland. I first went to Armenia in 1995. It was in 1995, I was working as a professor at the American University of Armenia. And one of my first excursions outside campus as a professor was to go to the National Museum of Armenia. This is the National Museum on Republic Square, right in the center of town. This is the shining star of our, our it's shining star is a repository of our history in Yerevan. And I was with a, a colleague and a friend, a woman named Gohar, who was showing me around, giving me a tour very, very, very excitedly to, to, and with great pride, showing me the various paintings and artifacts and, and displays. And I recall we got to a top floor of the universe of, of the uh, museum. And there was a room designated the defense of Vaughn. In this room, there were portraits of the Fedais, the soldiers who defended Vaughn. There were uh, diagrams, there were uh, illustrations, there were uh, narratives on the wall. And I can recall standing at one end of the hall of the defense of Vaughn room in the museum and looking to the other end. And I saw on the wall a map. And I said to Gohar, I said, that map, I recognize that map. That's got to be a map that was prepared, drawn, written by my uncle. And we went up to the map and I had her read to me what it said. And she said, yes, it sure enough, it says this map created by map maker Mardik Kheranya. And I was just beside myself with excitement for a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't realize that Mardik had made more than one map. All my life, I knew he had a map that was in my home in New Britain, Connecticut. And as far as I knew, that was the only map. And I was excited for the other reason that I realized for the first time, this man, Mardik, he must have been recognized as quite an important person for his contributions to Armenian culture and the preservation of Armenian history. Because here he is on display at the National Museum in Armenia. And this was the map. This was the map that we that we saw. And it's a map that, as I look at it now, I realize um, it wasn't preserved properly. It was it was displayed on a board to which it had been nailed. Uh, so no no care had been taken for the preservation of this map. But after seeing this map, I thought, wow, Uncle Martik was important. He's from Vaughn. I know that my family, or at least my father's side of my family, is from Vaughn. So what I did was I took a picture of this map and I brought it with me to Vaughn. It took me a couple of years to get to Vaughn, but by 1997, again, I was working at the AUA and I flew from Yerevan to Istanbul and then back from Istanbul over to Vaughn in search of what I thought would be my grandfather's home because I expected that I could use this map to map at least, if not all of the Armenian highland, then I could at least map where my grandfather was from. So when I got to Vaughn, this is what I found. This is what the map brought me to. Maps are supposed to ground us, give us directions. Well, in this case, it gave me directions, but it gave me directions to an empty field. The Armenian town of Vaughn, when I traveled there for the first time in 1997, was an empty field. And beside that empty field, there was a giant rock it's called the Rock of Vaughn. It's a fortress. The fortress is as tall as a football field is long. It's about a, a hundred meters tall. So I climbed to the top of the Rock of Vaughn and I leaned over the edge of the rock with my camera and I held my camera out and I photographed the field below which showed 
the Armenian town of Van. And all I could capture with my camera was sheep and a shepherd and these mounds. Everywhere I looked, I saw mounds. And what I realized is these mounds were all that was left of the Armenian town of Van. My map of Van had more detail than Van had because Van had been wiped clean in 1918. These mounds were the remnants of the foundations of the various Armenian homes that had occupied Van. And so I didn't find my grandfather's house in Van. The map of Mardik, the map that Mardik made of Van, brought me to Van but didn't show me the house. But as I walked throughout the field, and I spent one day, two days, three days walking through the fields of Van, I consoled myself with the understanding that I was certainly walking along the paths and the streets and the roadways that my grandfather must have walked upon. And I consoled myself with the belief that one of those mounds that I had walked upon may very well have been the mound that formed the foundation for my grandfather's house. Now, I, I, I'm not the first person to go to Western Armenia looking for his ancestral home. Uh, I know many people have done this. I did this with my grandmother as well. I went to Zada in the region of uh, Sepastia. And again, I had a map that showed me where the Armenian quarter was. And I went to the Armenian quarter and there were houses there, houses that looked like they could very easily have been 100 years old, which would have meant that they would have been standing at the time that my grandmother, my grandmother was sent on her death march in 1915. But the map that I had couldn't tell me which house belonged to my grandmother, couldn't tell me who lived in each particular house. I talked to people who I met there. And so oftentimes these Armenian towns and villages that we go to, um, they don't have any Armenians, but they do have people living there who know about the Armenians. And the narrative that they invariably tell is quite different from the narrative that we hear from the government. The government tells us there was no genocide. The government tells us there were no Armenians. But when we talk to the people on the ground, they tell us, yes, there were Armenians. My neighbors were Armenians. I remember the Armenians. My grandfather told me about the Armenians. And those are some of the stories that I heard when I went to visit places like Zada in Sepastia. So this was the beginnings of my attempt to map the Armenian highland. The impetus for it all really began back when I was 12 years old and first being exposed to Armenian school, to the AYF, to, uh, to the map in my family home. It was when my dad was about the same age as I was, about 12 years old. And this is a picture of my grandmother, my dad's mother. Uh, when he was at home in New Britain, Connecticut, uh, when one day a package arrived unsolicited in the mail. Now my grandmother here, you see here on the screen, my grandmother was a genocide survivor. She fled her home in Marzavan sometime around 1916. She was 16 years old and she resettled in New Britain, Connecticut. She met a man who would later become my grandfather in New Britain, Connecticut, and they started a family all in New Britain. And it was in the 1930s, the late 1930s, my dad was a, a, a young teenager, when a package arrived in the mail. And it was a manila envelope. It measured about 24 inches by 18 inches. It had fancy script on the cover and it had postmarks indicating that the envelope had traveled from Syria. The return address showed that it was from Mardik Kheranya. Now when my grandmother and grandfather saw this package in the mail, they must have gone out of their mind. It had been some 15 years since my grandfather had run this classified advertisement in the Hyrenik Daily. My grandfather was also from Western Armenia, from Van, and he had escaped to America roughly around 1915. 
He ran this ad searching for his family that he had lost. All his family from Vaughan had scattered. Some went to Yerevan in the east, some went to France and then to America in the west. And it turns out Mardik, my grandfather's uncle, fled to Syria. And it was that package from this man, Mardik Kheranyan, that first made my grandfather aware that Mardik had lived, that Mardik had survived the defense of Vaughan in 1918, and that he had escaped to Syria. So my grandfather opens up the envelope, and, and I know about this because my father told me what happened. My grandfather opens up the envelope, and there's a letter inside. And the letter is from Mardik, and it's addressed to Hovanes, my grandfather. And it says, Hovanes, and I'm paraphrasing, Hovanes, I'm alive. I made it to Syria. I hope you're well. I need money. Mardik had left everything behind. He had a successful life in Vaughan. He was a professor. He taught at Viragavank. He was a teacher of history and geography. And he left that all behind as a refugee after the uh, defense of Vaughan and after Vaughan fell in 1918. So some 15 years later, he's writing to my uncle saying, I need money. But he's not begging for money. He's not asking for money. What he's saying to my grandfather is, look in this envelope. I have enclosed a map that I created, this map of the Armenian highland. Dear Havanes, he says, I want you to sell the map, sell it for a lot of money, and send me the money so I can live, so I can have enough money for food and for rent. So my grandmother and grandfather unfurl the map, they display it on their dining room table. And as my father recounts the story, my grandfather looks at the map. And my grandfather says, we'll send Mardik as much money as we can, but we're not selling the map. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. One's, one's, a, one's a pragmatic decision on the part of my grandfather. The other is a less than pragmatic decision. Um, the pragmatic part of the decision that my grandfather made was, well, this is 1936, 34. Um, there's no market for an Armenian language map of Armenia. Who was gonna buy this map? How, how was my grandfather going to sell it and to whom and how much money could he possibly get for it during those economic times? That was the pragmatic part. I can't sell it because I won't get anything for it. But the non-pragmatic part of my grandfather's decision was this map is too precious to sell. I'm not parting with this. This is a family and a national heirloom. Well, what my grandfather did next was he took the map, and I guess for safekeeping, he folded it back up, and he put it back in that envelope that it had come in. And then they put that map in the envelope, in a drawer, and there it sat for perhaps 30, 35 years, untouched, unopened, undisplayed, forgotten. It wasn't until my grandfather died, and a few years after that, that my grandmother started going through all the things that my grandfather had left behind, including that map. And she found the manila envelope in one of her dresser drawers. She opened it up. She rediscovered the map after 35 years. And my grandmother gave it to my father. This is Varagavank. This is the, I mentioned this a, a few moments ago, the, the site where Mardik was working when he was in Vaughan. And this is Varagavank as it looks today. So, so my grandmother um, gives the map to my father, and my father frames it, mounts it, and covers it with glass. So for the first time in 35 or 40 years, it's outside of that manila envelope and it's on display. And, and I, I wanted to photograph it as part of my research for the Armenian Highland. I had so much difficulty photographing the map indoors because it was covered in glass and because my flash was bouncing off the light, bouncing off the glass. So one day I took the map into my mom's backyard. I said, Mom, can you hold this map up? It was an overcast, a partly cloudy day, so the lighting was very good for photography. 
And after I'd made a couple of images of the map for my research, I thought, let me take a step back. Because this woman, my mother, holding up this map, gives the map some scale. My mom's about five feet tall, five feet two inches tall, and she can barely see over the top of the map. That's how big this map is. This map measures 66 inches wide and 42 inches tall. It's a big map. And to my knowledge at this point in my life, it's the only one of its kind. Of course, I now know that that's not true. It's not the only one of its kind. It's not even the biggest of its kind. And it's not the oldest of its kind. But those, those images that I made here, you can see a, a high res image that I created of that same map, which I needed to make several images of and stitch them together. You can see a couple of stain marks uh, on the left. Whoops. You can see a couple of stain marks on the, the left side of the map. Those stains are visible on that manila envelope that I talked about. I have the manila envelope. Apparently somebody spilled something on the outside of the envelope, maybe when it was in transit from Syria. It soaked through the envelope and into the map, and you can see how the map was folded. That is one and the same stain that you see there. So armed with what I believed was the only map of its kind, I set out to map the Armenian highland through my camera. And I went to places like Digor, where Chutzkonk, the Armenian monastery of Chutzkonk, is located. This monastery consists of churches that are, one is a thousand years old, not the oldest of them is 1200 years old. This picture was made around 1910. It's about a 112-year-old photograph. I went to this location to document it, and when I got there, I located just one of the churches surviving. Uh, I discovered that four of the churches had been destroyed just in the past century. I went to places like Harpert, and I saw the ancient picture showing, ancient picture, 100-year-old picture showing the Armenian quarter of Harpert with the fortress of Harpert in the background. But when I traveled there in 2014, I found that the same place, that hillside that had been an Armenian quarter, was now just a hillside with grass and trees. The fortress remained. And as I went to each of these sites, as part of my mapping the Armenian highland project, I, I realized that there was some truth to my thought, to 12-year-old me, what 12-year-old me thought when I said this map is a map of what used to be, this place that used to be Armenia. And I thought, these pictures that I see, these old black and white images, this is what Armenia used to be. And when I go back today, this is what Armenia is today. And I drew a comparison with my photography and Mardik's maps. And I realized that Photography and cartography are in so many ways similar, at least when it comes to preserving our ancestral culture. And that is that the map shows what was. It shows the extent of what was. It places us in time. It grounds us. And our photography does the same thing. Our photography says this is what was. This is what we had in 1910. This is Sur uh, not too far from, from Bitlis and Mush in Western Armenia. And when I went a century later, this is what was in 2017, the same place. And what I sometimes wonder is, 100 years from now, will people look at these images from 2017 and 2018 and 2020 and say, gosh, how did we let how did we lose what we had in 2020? Because there is no guarantee that what we have today will still be here tomorrow. Each of these places that I went to, I looked at buildings, I looked at rubble, I looked at stones, but I also found people. And, you know, there are still Armenians living in Western Armenia. And this is something that the photographs and the maps don't always reveal. But in this particular case, I was traveling in the region of Shadak, uh, south of Van, and, and you know, if you want to find Armenians in Western Armenia, 
you, you don't walk up to somebody and ask them if they're Armenian. Instead, what you do is you go to a tonir, you go to a bakery where they're making lavash, and you can kind of guess that maybe these people are either Armenian or at least they like Armenian bread. In this case, it was both. The people that we were greeted by oftentimes had a little bit of hostility. Here we have an encounter trying to get access to an Armenian church. Um, that's Khajik Miradan, you see on the right, talking to the, uh, the leader of a military base carrying a sidearm. Khajik got us into the Armenian, uh, got us access to the Armenian church. Uh, other times we would encounter people who didn't seem quite as threatening, but nevertheless could be. You know, when you're a photographer, you don't just look forward when you're walking forward, you turn around a lot. And here I was in Chunkush, walking up the hill through the Armenian Quarter, when it occurred to me that I needed to look around and see what was behind me. And when I turned behind me, I saw that I was being followed by two men, one in a suit and one in a sweater. And I, I asked the men why they were following me all the way through Chunkush, through the Armenian Quarter. And the man in the sweater said, we're following you for your own safety. It turns out these men were what they call secret police. These were the people who were making sure that visitors from America, especially Armenian Americans, weren't doing anything wrong. So let me show you a little bit about what Mardik accomplished. You know, the, the, the map that I told you about earlier in National Museum of Yerevan. I saw that it was nailed to a board hanging on a wall. And I thought this is just, just, just inappropriate for it to have been displayed in such a manner. But as I researched more maps about Mardik, I realized that it wasn't really all that unusual for his maps to be treated in a way that wasn't consistent with their value. And here we have another one of Mardik's maps of Van, being displayed at the National Museum in Yerevan. And you can see that there are two workers from the museum who are holding it up. Their hands are not covered with gloves, they're, they're bare hands. They're stretching out the map, and if you look closely at the map, you can see it's covered with, uh, with stains and that there are holes, and that they're, they're stretching it out. So, so I was concerned about some of the maps that I was finding uh, concerned that they weren't being treated properly. Uh, this is the map that I saw for the first time at the National Museum, and you can see the nail holes, or, or the actual nails, in the four corners of the map. So Mardik was from Vaughan. He was in Vaughan until 1918, when Vaughan finally fell to the enemy. And so Van, uh, or, or Mardik rather, he created first what he knew most. He created maps of Van. And here you can see Lake Van, roughly at the left center of the map, and the entire region of Van surrounding it. This is another one of, of Mardik's <coughs> another one of Mardik's <coughs> um, really detailed maps of Van. <coughs> Just um, today, I discovered yet another map of Van. One of the things that I've learned during my research of the Armenian highland is that the more I research um, and the more I search for Mardik's maps, the more I realize that there's so much more out there that people don't really always draw the lines with or, or connect the dots to. And so today I discovered this map at Nasser, a map that I've never before seen by Mardik. It appears to be a copy, a black and white copy of what must have been a color original. It looks like the copy was made in 1930. I've never before seen this map. Um, and I'm going to start doing some more research into finding the provenance of this map. I published a book uh, in 2019, The Armenian Highland. During my book tour, 
I would talk about Mardik's maps. And I was doing a presentation in Fresno when during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation, uh, someone raised his hand and said, you know, I love your maps. They're really beautiful. Uh, I have one. And I thought, wow, okay, that's nice. You have a copy of one of my uncle's maps. And the man said, no, I actually have an original map. And so we talked a bit, we exchanged contact information, and he sent me a photograph of a map that he had on display in his living room in his home. And this is a copy of that map. And this is how I have learned about so many of Mardik's maps. What started out as 12-year-old me believing that there was just one map of Mardik that Mardik had created and that it was in my home evolved into an understanding that Mardik was a man who created maps for a living and that there were many iterations even of the same location and Vaughn was one of those locations that Mardik loved to draw and depict and share. So here is that high resolution image of the map that I first saw as a 12 year old in the basement of my home. This map measures roughly five and a half feet um, wide and three and a half feet tall. It's huge. It was made, Mardik made it in 1928. I later learned that the ARF in Watertown had an older and a bigger map, also by Mardik. This map was made by Mardik in 1922. This map measures eight feet wide and five feet tall. It's about twice as big as the map that I have in my custody. The map's slightly different. There's some variations. It appears to have some topography uh, that was missing from my map. The, the map in my custody shows many villages, uh, it is a documentary map. It is an attempt, apparently, to document every village and every town on the Armenian highland. And you can see right at the center of the map, Lake Vaughan, which perhaps is at the center for the reason that it is at the center of Mardik's heart as well. Whereas the map that is in the custody of the ARF is more colorful, it is, it, and it shows topographical highlights, and it appears to show fewer villages and towns than the map that is in my custody. So that's two maps now of the Armenian highland, in addition to all the maps of Van that we know exist. While traveling in Armenia, I had heard rumors that Etchmiadzin also had a map that was produced by Mardik. And sure enough, Etchmiadzin had on, has on display an equally large map from 1922. And I learned about this with the assistance of a man named Yereshe Karanyan. He's a cousin of mine. He's also a descendant of Mardik. And he's the person who brought to my attention that there was a third map in the custody of Etchmiadzin. And so each place I went to in the diaspora I always had on my mind the, um, the Mardik's maps. And so on one trip that I took to the Armenian Museum of America in Watertown, I made it a point to ask if they knew anything about these maps. And I showed them pictures of the maps that I had. And at the Armenian Museum of America, I was told, well, yes, of course we know about that map. In fact, we have a version of it. And they showed me this version, a replica of a map by Mardik, yet a fourth version. and. There's a fifth version in Detroit uh, that I haven't been able to see. So we know of at least five versions of the Armenian Highland map. What, what is so interesting to me is that with each of these Armenian Highland maps that I've been able to locate, and even with the maps of Vaughn that I've been able to locate, when I ask the people who have custody of the map, whether the, per, the current custodian is a museum or an institution or an individual. When I ask them, how did you get the map? Tell me about its provenance. I invariably get a dead end. I get, well, I, I've had it in my family for many years, or 
I acquired it from this person, but I don't know how that person got the map. So, so the provenance is hard to trace, and it doesn't go back too far. The difference with the map in my custody, the map of the Armenian highland that I have, is I can trace the provenance all the way back to Marduk's hands. Marduk created the map. He put it in an envelope and mailed it from Syria to my grandfather in New Britain, Connecticut. It sat in my grandfather's house for some 35 years. My grandfather gave it to my father. My father gave it to my mom. My mom gave it to me. It's been in our family without interruption ever since Marduk created it. And this is a, a, a story of the provenance of the map that I haven't been able to recreate for any of the other maps. The map that's in the custody of the ARF, and, and I keep using the word custody, and I, I want to explain what I mean by that. You know, there's, there's at least five maps of the Armenian Highland and several maps of Vaughn in existence. I don't think that any of us can claim to be an owner of that map. The, the, the maps that Marduk created belong to the Armenian nation. And I think that anybody who has possession of a map has custody of it. And that custody is a sacred, a sacred right uh, that must be exercised to preserve the map, to preserve the contents of the map for the, uh, for the Armenian nation. And this is just what the ARF did with its map in its custody in Watertown. Its giant five foot by eight foot map had been on display for years and years and years at the archives uh, at, the, uh, at the ARF headquarters in Watertown. When Georgia Jan just about two years ago embarked on a project to preserve the map and to ensure that it would forever be available uh, for all posterity to study. Um, he uh, contracted with um, Louise Baptiste, uh, a conservator, a map conservator and documentary uh, conservator at Harvard University. He talked to the people at the Harvard Map Library and he made arrangements for them to remove the map from the Heidenik building, vacuum it, clean it, um, uh, preserve the, the inks and the paper and to ensure that the map would survive, at least in its physical form, for at least another century. And in addition to all that, he also worked with a photographer, a man named Robert Zink at Harvard University. He's a digital imager for, at Harvard University. And Mr. Zink, the photographer, used a 100 megapixel camera, and he made eight images of that five foot by eight foot map. Then he carefully stitched together those eight images, those 800 megapixel images of the map. And he created one large digital file. And that file is available online uh, at hushamajan.org. So this, this whole conservation project uh, is, to my knowledge, the first of its kind. It preserves the map physically and it also makes the map available digitally so that we can all share and understand and study the contents of the map. The, um, it was an expensive project, I understand. It was funded by the Armenian Cultural Association of America and uh, by the Armenian Communities Department of the Kaluist Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, and this is um, one step in the right direction. You know, we saw those maps that I showed you of Vaughn that uh, at the National Museum of Armenia that were being held up and stretched and nailed to boards. And that's the worst extreme. That's, that's showing the map today for our current gratification to look at something now, but it doesn't take into account the future. And what, what Georgia Jayan spearheaded with the IRF's map is an attempt to make sure that this map, even if the map physically doesn't survive, 
forever. At least there will be digital images of it that do survive forever for us to study. Um, you know, this uh, his the the account of the preservation of that huge ARF map was written up in the Armenian Weekly newspaper. Um, and here you can see a PDF of it. If you'd like to take a look at that newspaper account, um, you can go onto the armenianweekly.com and, and do a search for the historic Armenia map. You know, Mardik, Mardik was a brilliant cartographer. He was uh, painstakingly detailed in his efforts to include every town, every village, every Armenian place name, and it was because of Mardik's maps that I was able to locate so many places in Western Armenia. The maps that we have today at our disposal, the ones that are currently produced, uh, don't have the Armenian names. They have Turkish or Kurdish names of the place names. And in many cases, in, in I'd venture to say more than half of the cases, the Armenian towns don't exist at all. There is not even a Turkish or a Kurdish place name substituting. So these maps that Mardik created are a historical record that is unequaled. I know of no other source, no other source that documents every town and every village throughout the Armenian highland, that's Western Armenia and Eastern Armenia, using their original Armenian place names. In addition to that, Mardik was an artist. And we can look at a couple of the keys of two of his maps and get an indication of how his artistry evolved over the years. This is the key that you see on the screen here. This is the key of the ARF map, that large five foot by eight foot map that I mentioned, the one that was preserved, which Mardik Kheranyan made in 1922. And here you can see the artistry that he used, the calligraphy style that he used, and the colors that he used. And if you look very closely on the screen, you can see that there are Armenian language inscriptions on two of the letters uh, um, that this word across the top says Hayastan, and right that's directly above 1922, the year that the map was, was drawn. Just a few years later, the map that is in my custody, the key, the design of the key has evolved differently. Now he's using the tricolor, the Gadmid Gabud, Nadin Jaguin, the, the three colors of the Armenian flag, red, blue, and orange, to spell out the word Hayastan at the very top of the key. And the, the 1928, you can see at the bottom. And if you look on the lower right-hand corner, you can see uh, he has inscribed his name. Uh, and But he puts his name in a very, very small <coughs> and modest script. You know, I've talked a little bit about the maps that we know exist that were created by Mardik. We could do an entire university level class on his artistry and his, his cartography. Um, but for the purpose of this, this uh, one hour introductory presentation about Mardik and about mapping the Armenian highland, um, it suffice to say that without Mardik's dedication to his homeland, we would be without information about most of the Armenian villages that were wiped out and destroyed after 1915. So I'd like to thank you for, for joining me on this presentation today. You know, I've, I told you earlier that I published a book about the Armenian highland. The book is sold out, and uh, so many people have expressed interest in the photography from the Armenian highland book that this year I curated 13 of the photographs from the book and produced them, uh, put them in a, a calendar that's available now if you go to historicarmeniabook.com, www.historicarmeniabook.com. Uh, you can get... Uh, this calendar, which will show you 13 of the photographs from the Armenian highland, as well as Mardik's, a reproduction of Mardik's map. So thank you very much. And I'll turn this back over to 
to Mark. Matthew, thank you so much. That's uh, amazing stuff. Uh, and and I again invite the audience uh, to submit questions using the Q and A at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. A couple of people asked for the link to be posted to the Hushamadian page where they can access the map. I have done so in the chat. Uh, so let me start with some of my hundreds of questions. Uh, how many maps are currently known to exist that he created as far as, as far as your information goes? Well, I, I can account for five maps of the Armenian highland. And it looks like up until this morning, I believe that there were four maps of Vaughn or the Vaughn region. However, today, Nasser sent me a copy of a, a map of Vaughn that I had never before seen. It was a, a map that appears to be a copy of a, a map of Vaughn, the copy made probably in 1930. It looks like a black and white copy of what would have been originally a color map. And that adds one more map to my understanding of what he created. And you know, Mark, what's interesting is every time I do a presentation about the Armenian Highland, uh, I learn more. I get additional leads about additional maps. And I mentioned that instance in Fresno where someone said, oh, I've got one of his maps uh, in my house. And, and that's a lot of uh, how I learn about some of these maps. I started out thinking that my map, not my map, the map that's in my custody, was the only map of its kind. And I have learned over the years that that's not true, that there are other maps, and that Marjik was a prolific cartographer. Yeah, I uh, had never really noticed or paid close attention to that that copy, that black and white map that uh, I sent you just just today, or uh, because I, I just never looked at it closely. Uh, then I realized a week or so ago that it had had his name on it. It's about 11 by 17. Um, it tells you once again, if we need to be reminded, that things that we see all the time or that we look at from time to time but don't pay close attention to oftentimes are of great significance. And uh, perhaps that's that's a lesson we should, we should remind ourselves of. Uh, Mark Arslan has the same question that I have, which is, uh, what happened to your uncle Mardik? Did he ever come to America? What became of him after the correspondence with your grandfather in the 1930s? This is what's so heartbreaking. Um, and, and this is a, a, a story that can be repeated in family after family after family. Um, I showed in my presentation that my grandfather had posted a classified advertisement uh, he posted that advertisement in, in 1919, looking for family members who he had lost after the genocide. He made contact with Mardik, but making contact with somebody in the 1930s was not the same as making contact with somebody in 2022. We relied upon 100 years ago, uh, the mail system between Syria and the United States, states, which was not reliable. And so beyond that initial communication, nothing is known. And I've sp spoken to family members in Yerevan. I've spoken to family members all over. What can you tell me? What do we know about Mardik, Mardik's family? Very little is known. Um, and this is, this is unfortunately um, a result of, of the lack of communications that we had a century ago. It was just hard to find out, hard to find anything out about anybody. So I'm hoping through my presentations and through my celebrations of Mardik that people will come forward with any information that they have because what we're doing is forensic history. We're trying to dig up what we know and put pieces together and try to assemble a picture of what our past life was like. And hushamajan.org is a good example of an organization doing exactly that, gathering pieces of information from throughout the diaspora and seeing if we can assemble them into something that's coherent. So you don't know when he died? You don't know if he had children, anything? I know that he was one of three brothers and that my grandfather was his nephew. That's what I know about Mardik. 
I know that Marduk participated in the defense of Vaughn, that he remained there until 1918. Marduk fled in 1918 south to Syria. And we don't know why he went to Syria as opposed to going to Yerevan, which is where so many other members of my family went, or why he didn't attempt to go to France, which is where my grandfather first went before coming to America. So there's a lot of gaps, and unfortunately, we don't have a written uh, history to fill those gaps in. Uh, over how many years, as, again, based on the maps that you know of, uh, over how, how many years were the maps created? Or were they created in multiple locations? And did he do only Van and region as in addition to the overall Ayastan map? So he's, Marduk stuck with what he knew. He knew Van. And so we see several iterations of the town of Van and of the region of Van. We also see maps of Shushan, which is the region right next to, next to Van. The maps that we know about are dated from 1922 to 1928. Now, this may be the date that he completed the map. It may be, uh, it, it's not clear from the key what the date indicates, but it, it seems likely that it's the date that he completed the map. So it looks like we have a period of, of about six or seven years when he was completing maps. I am told that while he was teaching at Varagavank, and he was teaching either history or geography or a related field, that he would give his students their lesson, and then he would oftentimes retreat to the back or the front of the classroom, and then work on his maps. So what he was doing a lot of times was he was doing the work of a scribe. Think of the, the, the scribes who were copying manuscripts. They were painstakingly painting the pages of each book. And in many times, what, what Marduk was doing was the same thing. He was taking his template, he had a copy of his map of Van, or he had his original map of historic Armenia, the Armenian highland, and then he would copy it. So one wonders if perhaps uh, there was one master template that he was designing from, and if that template exists somewhere, uh, I suppose if we really wanted to get to the bottom of this, we would have to travel to Syria and find his family, surviving family in Syria, to see if we could locate. There may be maps in someone's sock drawer in Syria that are unknown to the person who owns them. But these maps were created in Syria, as far as you know. So as far as I know, he was working on some maps in Varagavank. Yep. That would have been before 1918. I don't have an example of a map with a date of 1918 or earlier on it. Um, I, although I think the map that you shared with us today has, a, has an earlier date. Uh, so the other maps that he created, he would have created them in Syria. And the map that is in my custody, he certainly created in Syria. He mailed it from Syria. Right. It doesn't say in the cartouche uh, anything about created in, you know, Damascus or uh, Aleppo or what have you. Marduk's, um, the information that he creates uh, and that he uses in the key is regrettably uh, very limited. And uh, he must have been a modest person because even his own name, he puts almost as an afterthought in very, very small script. So there are a number of other questions about process and uh, to the extent that you you are aware or, or can speculate about it. Uh, did he, does he seem to have created these on his own? Is there indication that he worked with uh, assistance or had help in preparing them? Uh, do you know, well, let me ask that and then move on to the others. Marjik was an artist and he was a passionate Armenian. He created these maps for two reasons. One, love of country, and two, he did it for a living. You know, so much of what we do, we do because we expect some form of remuneration. And he did expect to sell these maps. And this is one plausible reason why there are so many versions of the Vaughn map uh, that exist. He wasn't creating them uh, simply because he wanted to document what was there. He had already documented it, but he was making duplicate originals and adding various artistic flourishes to each of them uh, with the interest of, of selling them. 
think of him as a Picasso or a painter. <clears throat> He's creating his artwork because of his love for the art form, but also there is an expectation of earning a living. And and yet you don't have uh, well maybe with the possible exception of that that map that I sent you today. But is there any indication that there were uh, copies of the map uh, of of these maps produced in any mass quantity? So at the Armenian Museum of America in Watertown, I discovered uh, about a half dozen copies of one of the maps I showed on the in the PowerPoint. That copy was made relatively recently, perhaps in the past 20 years, by a person who happened to have a copy. So much like if I was to make a, a high-res image of, of, the, of the map in my custody. Other than that, no. And, and that's what's so um, really heart, one of the heartbreaking parts of this story is that these maps are so valuable to our history and to our culture, and they've been so terribly overlooked by all of us. We, we, we really, as a nation, have failed to understand how significant these maps are for our culture and for our history. I'd like to see, you know, I'm so grateful uh, to, to Georgia Jane at the ARF for taking the lead in preserving that huge, the largest and the oldest of Amar Deek's maps of the Armenian highland, but not apparently the most detailed of his maps. Uh, to make them available for, uh, for research purposes. And we need to do that with each of his maps. It's an expensive process, it's a laborious process, but it's one that's, uh, I think, vital for our country. Are, are you able to infer from the maps how, uh, I mean, did he, was he working strictly from his firsthand knowledge or was he, was he uh, drawing on, on other sources for either the map design the map uh, templates or the information on the maps i would love to know the answer to that I, I wish i could go to syria tomorrow and find out who he was working with what were his sources I, for the map of van it's reasonable to infer that he was drawing this map from memory or that he was going out to the street and making sketches so that he could then return to his studio and and make the final designs there but for the maps of the armenian highland I do not understand how he could have drawn a map in such intricate detail showing all the villages and all the towns from Western Armenia to Eastern Armenia. I don't understand how he did that. I want to learn how he did it. There weren't any sources that he could have used. It wasn't like he could open up an atlas and copy the atlas. There was no atlas. If there was an atlas, we'd have the atlas. All we have is Marduk's work. So how did he get the information? Where, what was his source? I, we need to find out what his sources were. I don't believe, it's reasonable for us to believe, that he traveled to all these towns. I don't see how he could have done that. I mean, just traveling around Vaughn was difficult enough. He would have gone by horseback or by, by cart. But just to clarify, he didn't do any other cities or regions in that kind of detail, correct? N no. Not that I have seen. Yeah. I, I don't believe he did. So it's possible he could have drawn on a multitude of sources, of course. Uh, there, were, there were other maps, but perhaps not quite like that. He could have drawn some from this, some from that. One possibility, and that's a very good possibility, is that he drew upon several sources. And so there may have been a source of Sepastja, a source for Erzurum, and he may have assembled those sources uh, to create his own, his own one unifying map of the Armenian highland. Uh, but as far as Vaughn, he did it for Shushan, he did it for other small regions near Vaughn. Uh, I believe it's reasonable to infer that he, that he had first-hand knowledge of those. So uh, one of the viewers points out that there may be uh, uh, churches in Syria um, that have documentation or information about Marduros. Um, that, that is certainly seems like a possibility. And there's also another uh, attendee that I will connect you with, uh, Matthew, who thinks his grandparents may have known Marduros. So uh, well, I'd like to be in touch with them. We will see what comes of that, indeed. Uh, I, I hope this may lead to more 
more information and more knowledge uh, for you and for the, eventually, therefore, the rest of us about this amazing person. Well, if anyone watching either live now or later on, on, on YouTube or on a recording, if you think you have information about Mardik, if you think you know something about these maps, if you've seen one of these maps somewhere, contact Nasser. Yeah, uh, I will put you direct. I will put you in touch with Matthew. Anyone who has uh, f more information or insights, or yes, best of all, uh, one of the maps, uh, uh, we will we will advance that uh, right to Matthew. Uh, my last question for you is. Um, did you it, was there any knowledge in your family uh, about well I, I guess the answer is no but was there any knowledge in your family about the, the scope of his work other than the map that you had uh, in, in your home so when Marjik mailed the map from Syria to my grandfather it, it was like uh it was like a treasure falling from heaven. And as far as we knew, this was one of a kind. We couldn't get on the phone to Mardik and say, hey, Mardik, you know, what have you been up to? Is this the only map you've ever done? Are there others? No, there was no communication. We got a letter and I got a package, got an envelope with a map, and that was it. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for us today to wrap our heads around the lack of knowledge that people could have and how not only could they have a lack of knowledge, but they could then just say, okay, well, that's it. I have a lack of knowledge without pursuing it. Because today we'd say, okay, if I don't know something, I'm going to get on my phone. I'm going to get on my computer. I'm going to get on the telephone. I'm going to find the answers. There were no vehicles of that sort a hundred years ago. And so my family, I, I, I mentioned 12 year old me. I thought this was the a one of a kind map. I thought this was it. And I'm not taking away from the importance of the map by saying that it's not one of a kind. It's one of one of a few. But as far as we knew, it was one of a kind. And I wish we had more information uh, from Mardik about how he made them, what the process was, why he did it, and whatever happened to him. There's so much in this story about, about uh... The history of, of the Armenian people, upon, I don't mean the maps themselves, but of, of displacement, diaspora, separation, losing track of people, losing track of knowledge, and then only later uh, happily uh, rediscovering it. So I, I commend you tremendously for the work you've, you've done uh, to, to rediscover your, your great uncle's work. Uh, and of course, in all the great work that you do. So thank you so much for uh, giving this presentation. Thank you to the Dadurian Foundation for supporting uh, these programs on maps and cartography. And of course, thank you to the excellent audience uh, for joining us and for your questions and comments. And uh, I will uh, put you in touch with the, with the gentleman in the audience. Fingers crossed that he can uh, lead you to some more discoveries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.